Hello and a warm welcome to our service of worship here in Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. It's good that you've been able to join us today. Just a few announcements before we begin the service properly. Again, join us on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock for our Zoom prayer meeting. Uh, again, it's important that we meet together for prayer, uh, to pray for the world as we go through this coronavirus crisis, to pray also for the extension of Christ's kingdom throughout the world. And we can pray for one another here in Emmanuel. So that's on Wednesday at 7 o'clock on Zoom. If you need the login details, just contact me. And then as we continue in lockdown, we hope to have another of these online services next Sunday, so watch out for that. European Mission Fellowship are having their spring conference by Zoom on Saturday the 13th of March from 2.30pm to 4.30pm. The theme is Unleashing God's Word, the Bible's message proclaimed and published. The main speakers will be Edwin Ewart, uh, Principal of the Irish Bible College, and Paul Levy, the Minister of International Presbyterian Church in Ealing. And there'll also be missionary speakers taking part. Uh, you can contact me for Zoom login details, but I'll also provide a link on the church Facebook page. You don't need to register, you just need to turn up on Zoom and let me encourage you to take part in that. Uh, so again, we can pray for the extension of Christ's kingdom throughout Europe. And then it's with sorrow that I have to announce the death last Saturday of Mrs. Florence Neely. Mrs. Neely, of course, was the wife of the Reverend Jim Neely, a former minister of Emmanuel. The funeral service took place on Wednesday in First Ahochel Presbyterian Church. Please keep Stephen and Mark and the family in your prayers. We're here to worship God and in Lamentation 3 it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end, they are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. So magnify the Lord with me, Let's exalt his name together. Let's praise God by singing, Great is thy faithfulness. Sun, moon, and stars 
We turn to God in prayer and let's pray. Almighty God, our Father, we give thanks to you for your steadfast love which never ceases and for your mercies which never come to an end. Every day you help us and every day we can count on you because you are a trustworthy God and your faithfulness is very great. You are God, our provider, who provides us with every good thing we need each day. You are our rock so that we can cling to you for stability when everything else is changing. You are our refuge and strength to whom we can turn for help. You are God, our shepherd, who guides us and protects us. You're the father of compassion and the God of mercies. And all of us can look to you to help us. And you are God our Saviour. And you sent your one and only Son into the world as one of us to deliver us from our sin and misery by his life and death and resurrection. You sent your Spirit into your lives to enable us to repent and to believe. You've given us the assurance of sins forgiven and the hope of everlasting life. Heavenly Father, we know we don't deserve everlasting life in your presence because we're sinners who sin against you continually in thought and word and deed. And because we're sinners, we don't deserve your provision or your protection or your help each day. We deserve to be condemned and sent out of your presence and punished. Because we haven't loved you as we should with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And nor have we loved our neighbour as ourselves. We've broken your laws and your commandments. And we have lived to please ourselves. And while we receive and enjoy your good gifts each day. We don't give you the thanks that you deserve. And so Heavenly Father we confess that we are sinners. But do not treat us as our sins deserve. Do not repay us according to our iniquity. But will you treat us according to your mercy? And will you forgive us for the sake of Christ our Saviour who loved us and who gave up his life for us? For his sake, remove our sins from us and remember them no more. And will you fill us with your Spirit to help us to walk in your ways and to do your will each day, just as it's done in heaven above. And will you help us to worship you today? Help us to listen to your word and to receive it with faith and humility and to hide it in our hearts. And we pray that your word will bear fruit in our lives. Help us to give thanks to you in our prayers. And will you build us up in holiness and comfort through faith in your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Having confessed our sins, hear the good news from 1 John. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God for his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Well, we've been going through the books of the Bible with the, uh, the boys and uh, girls. And uh, we're on the fifth book of the Bible today. So we've already done Genesis, the book of beginnings, the beginning of the Bible. And it tells the, the story of the beginning of the world. And then there was the book of Exodus, uh, which was about how God rescued his people. Uh, from Egypt where there were slaves to bring them to the promised land. Then there was the book of Leviticus and it was all about the, uh, the sacrifices the people had to bring whenever they wanted to worship God to say sorry for their sins and those sacrifices of course pointed to Christ who offered himself as the perfect sacrifice for sins. And then last week you remember I had lots of numbers on the screen because we were thinking about the book of Numbers and the book of Numbers is about uh, God's people in the wilderness as they made their way to the promised land. And uh, you'll see on the screen uh, another number, not as big as the numbers uh, in the book of Numbers, 
Uh, this is the number 10. And I've got the number 10 because we're doing the fifth book of the Bible, uh, which is the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. And it's really all about God's law. And so it includes the Ten Commandments. Uh, so God's people, they're just waiting to go into the promised land uh, with Moses. And uh, Moses is giving them some final instructions before they cross over the Jordan River to go into the promised land. And uh, so Moses went over the Ten Commandments and all the other laws that they had to remember and keep. I wonder, can you remember the, the Ten Commandments? Or can you remember uh, the little actions I think I've uh, shown you before to help us remember what the Ten Commandments are? Uh, I wonder, can you remember the first one? Remember the first commandment is, well, there's only one God, and so we should worship him alone. And then the second commandment is, well, we shouldn't bow down to uh, false gods and idols. Uh, we shouldn't worship them because we're to worship the Lord only. Then there's a third commandment, and uh, if you think about uh, the names of God, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so the third commandment is about uh, keeping God's name holy, so being careful how we speak about God. So you imagine putting your hand over your mouth, being careful what you say about God. And then the, uh, the fourth commandment, you remember it's about Sundays and how we're to rest on Sundays so all during the week we're busy because we're working or maybe we're just busy playing we're busy watching tv playing video games all kinds of things we can be busy about during the week but then on the fourth day or the, no on the seventh day uh, we're to take a break from all of that we're to rest from all that and we're to worship God so the fourth commandment is about keeping Sundays special then there's the fifth commandment and if you imagine you're holding your, your mummy's hand or your daddy's hand, well, you're to remember to keep, uh, you remember to honour your parents, you remember to obey your parents, do what they say. Uh, the sixth commandment, do you remember the sixth commandment? It is, uh, don't murder, don't hurt anyone, uh, don't hurt anyone at all. That's the sixth commandment. Uh, seventh commandment, well, that's uh, mums and dads, they're to love one another always. That's the seventh commandment. The eighth commandment, well, you imagine taking stuff. You're not to take what doesn't belong to you. You're not to steal. That's the eighth commandment. The ninth commandment, again, it's about speaking. So you imagine putting your hands over your mouth. This time, we're not to tell lies. Uh, we're not to speak about other people and tell stories and lies about them. And then the tenth commandment, imagine grabbing hold of things. We're, we're to stop wanting more and more and more for ourselves. So those are the Ten Commandments, and uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, God's people, they're about to cross the Jordan River to go into the Promised Land, and Moses reminded them of the Ten Commandments that God wanted them to keep, as well as all the other laws uh, that God gave them. I've got ten. Uh, here's another number. I've got four. Four because the first four commandments are all about loving God. So uh, because we love God, we're to worship only him. Because we love God, we're not to bow down the other idols. Because we love God, we're going to be careful about what we say about him. Because we love God, we're going to rest on Sundays so we can worship him. Rest from our work so that we can worship him. The first four commandments are all about loving God. And uh, here's another number. It's six. And so the... Uh, the last six commandments, they're about loving the people around you, loving your parents. Uh, so honouring them, obeying them, uh, loving the people around you so you don't hurt them and you don't steal from them and you don't tell lies about them and uh, you don't want what they have. You don't want all of their stuff. So the last six commandments are about loving your neighbour. Here's another number. It's the number one. Uh, there's only one person who has ever kept all of the commandments, all of the time, there's only one person who has ever obeyed the commandments perfectly. And I'm sure you know who it is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, I haven't kept the commandments perfectly. Uh, your parents haven't kept the commandments perfectly. You haven't kept the commandments perfectly. No one has kept the commandments perfectly except for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one who has kept God's law perfectly. 
And so that means that whenever he died on the cross, he wasn't being punished for his own sins because he didn't have any. He was being punished for your sins and my sins so that by believing in Jesus, we can have forgiveness and eternal life. I've got one more number. Uh, we've had 10, we've had four, we've had six, we've had one. The last number is three because there are three ways the Ten Commandments can help us. Three ways that the Ten Commandments can help us. The first way is this. They're kind of like a, a mirror. You know, of course, what a mirror is. You maybe you look uh, at your face in the mirror and you see, oh, there's some dirt there or there's some dirt there. You better wash away the dirt. The mirror helps you to see what you're really like or what you look like. And so the Ten Commandments, they're like a mirror for us. Because they show us what we're really like. We maybe think, you know, we're pretty good people. But then we read God's commandments and we realize, well, I haven't done that, I haven't done that, I haven't done that. We realize I'm a sinner. The Ten Commandments are like a mirror and they show us that we're sinners, that we've disobeyed God. The second way that the commandments can help us is they're like a, a, a sign or, or a pointer. They point us to the Lord Jesus Christ. They point us to the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the only one who has kept the commandments and he's the one who died to save us from our sins. We're the ones who've done wrong, but by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, God forgives us. So the commandments are like a mirror. They show us that we're sinners, that we've done wrong, and they point us to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior. And then the commandments, they're like a, a guidebook because they show us uh, the way God wants us to live our lives. Uh, we trust in the Lord Jesus for forgiveness. And then we look at the commandments and say, this is how God wants us to live. This, these are the things he wants us to do. He wants boys and girls to honour your parents, to love your parents and to listen to them and to obey them. Sometimes there's a wee voice inside of you saying, no, I will not do what you want. But no, we're not to listen to that voice. It's the voice of sin. We're instead to listen to the voice of God who says to boys and girls that you're to honour your mother and your father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your commandments. We're sorry because we know we've broken them and we've disobeyed you and we're sinners. But we thank you for Jesus who died to pay for our sins. He took the blame for all that we have done wrong. And so will you forgive us and will you help us to do your will and to keep your commandments. Amen. Well now we're going to uh, read from God's word. So if you've got a Bible, uh, please turn with me to 2 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 4. We're going to read all of chapter 4 and up to verse 16 of chapter 5. So it's 2 Samuel and we're going to start uh, at verse 1. Chapter 4. And this is God's word. When Ishbosheth, son of Saul, heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he lost courage, and all Israel became alarmed. Now Saul's son had two men who were leaders of raiding bands. One was named Ba'ana and the other Rechab. They were sons of Rimmon, the Beerothite, uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. Beeroth is considered part of Benjamin because the people of Beeroth uh, fled to Gitea and have lived there as aliens to this day. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became crippled. His name was Mephibosheth. Now, Rechab and Ba'ana, uh, the sons of Rimmon, the Beerothite, uh, set out for the house of Ishbosheth, and they arrived there in the heat of the day while he was taking his noonday rest. They went into the inner part of the house as if to get some wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and his brother Ba'ana 
slipped away. They had gone into the house while he was lying on the bed in his bedroom. After they stabbed and killed him, they cut off his head. Taking it with them, they travelled all night by way of the Arabah. They brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron and said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, your enemy, who tried to take your life. This day the Lord has avenged my lord the king against Saul and his offspring. David answered Rechab and his brother Baana, the sons of Rimon, the Berothite, as surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered me out of all trouble, when a man told me Saul is dead and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and put him to death in Ziklag. That was his reward. That was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more, when wicked men have killed an innocent man in his own house and on his own bed, should I not now demand his blood from your hand and rid the earth of you? So David gave an order to his men and they killed them. They cut off their hands and feet and hung the bodies by the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in Abner's tomb at Hebron. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to Saul, uh, sorry, the Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. On that day, David said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and lame will not enter the palace. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. After he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem, and more sons and daughters were born to him. These are the names of the children born to him there. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Elada, and Elephelet. And we'll end reading there. And we thank God for his word to us today. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well now, um, last week's passage, it contained a, a note about David's children and it contained the making of a covenant and it contained a murder. Uh, we read last week that David had six sons while he was in Hebron and we read that Abner and David established a covenant by which David, with Abner's support, would become king of all Israel. But then Joab murdered Abner in the city gates. And today's passage also contains a note about David's children and the making of a covenant and a murder. Uh, first, we have the murder of Ishbosheth. Then, we have the making of a covenant between David and the elders of Israel to make David king of all Israel. 
and then we have a note about David's children. So today's passage mirrors last week's passage. And it also tells us how David, uh, once he became king of all Israel, uh, took over the city of Jerusalem and made it his city, the city of David. And really, today's passage is uh, very significant. It's very significant in the history of salvation because it's about David becoming king and David foreshadows the true and final king who was coming into the world, who is Jesus Christ, the Saviour, who is even now extending his kingdom throughout the world through the preaching of the gospel by which he calls men and women and boys and girls to leave behind their old life of sin and unbelief and to become members of God's kingdom of grace, which is an everlasting kingdom. And this passage is also about Jerusalem. And uh, Jerusalem foreshadows the new and heavenly Jerusalem, which we read about at the end of the Bible. And the new and heavenly Jerusalem is the church in glory. It's all of God's people in the new and better world to come where we shall be in the presence of the Lord and where we'll have perfect peace and rest forever on God's holy mountain. And so as we read about David becoming king of Israel and as we read about Jerusalem, we're to raise our thoughts up to heaven to Jesus Christ our King and we're to look forward into the future and to the great hope that Christ gives to all who trust in him. So let's turn to this passage now. And first we have the, the murder of Ishbosheth. Uh, Ishbosheth, you'll remember, was at Saul's last remaining son, and Abner had set him up as a rival king to David. But Abner is now dead. And according to verse 1, Ishbosheth lost courage. Uh, perhaps he didn't know that Abner had decided to switch sides. Perhaps he thought Abner was still on his side. But now that Abner was dead, who was there to support him and to help him to stand up to David? He lost his courage. And all Israel was alarmed by the news as well. And perhaps they thought that David had killed Abner. Happened, of course, but maybe they thought that David had killed Abner, and so perhaps they were wondering what was going, what was David going to do now? What was he going to do to them? But then we read about these two brothers who ha uh, were leaders of uh, raiding bands in uh, Ishbosheth's army. So they were mighty warriors, uh, fighting men. They'd seen action, and according to verse five, these two brothers set off for the house of Ishbosheth. And when they arrived, it was the middle of the day when the sun was at its hottest. And uh, Ishbosheth was having a nap. And these two brothers went into the inner part of the house to get some wheat. Or maybe that's a story they told the guards so that they could get in, into the house. And uh, when they got inside, they went into Ishbosheth's bedroom and uh, they stabbed him in the stomach. And then before slipping away, they cut off his head. A gruesome thing to do, but they wanted proof that Ishbosheth was really dead. And they wanted proof because they were going to tell David what they had done. Presumably, they were hoping that they would receive some kind of reward from David. And so they went to him and they presented to him the head of Ishbosheth and uh, expecting a reward. And uh, they announced that uh, to David, well, you know, here is the head of uh, your enemy. And uh, he tried to take your life, but now on your behalf, we have taken revenge on him. So aren't you pleased with us? But David wasn't pleased at all, was he? He refers to the man in chapter 1 who came from the battlefield with the news that he had killed Saul. Uh, he thought he was bringing good news to David, but David had that man killed. And uh, then David accused these two brothers of doing something worse. They're wicked men and they have killed an innocent man in his own house and in his own bed. And David said, shall I not demand his blood from your hand and rid the earth of you? And with that, David gave the order and his men killed these two brothers. 
Now, at the end of last week's uh, passage, do you remember what David said about himself? Do you remember he said that he was gentle? And David could say that he was gentle because although Abner was once David's enemy and had resisted and opposed David's kingdom, nevertheless, David was prepared to deal gently and kindly with Abner whenever Abner decided to switch his allegiance and to accept David as his king. Instead of holding a grudge against Abner, David was prepared to welcome him and to make peace with him. So David was gentle and kind towards Abner. So that's what we learned about David last week. And then we read this story and how David showed these two brothers no mercy. And he had them executed on the spot for killing Ishbosheth. Why wasn't he gentle towards these two brothers? Why didn't he deal kindly with them? And I think the answer is that on this occasion, David was acting in obedience to the Lord. He was, he was acting in obedience to the Lord. And you see, that's, what, that's one of the differences between Saul and David. Saul didn't obey the Lord, but David wants to obey the Lord. He wants to do God's will. And on this occasion, he was doing God's will. Uh, you see, his words in verse 11 about ridding the earth of these two brothers can also be translated, purge the earth. And those words come from Deuteronomy chapter 17. Now, what's Deuteronomy chapter 17 about? Well, it's about uh, various laws to do with the cities of refuge. God commanded his people to set aside a number of cities in the land of Israel to be cities of refuge. And whenever a man killed a ma another man accidentally, he uh, could uh, flee to the city of refuge in order to save his life from the avenger. And God gave an example of what might happen. So you're to imagine two men in a forest, they're chopping wood. One of them swings his axe, but the head of the axe comes off, flies through the air, hits his friend and kills him. Now the man didn't intend to kill his neighbor. It was an accident. But the dead man's family might be angry and they might, might want to take revenge. And so on those occasions, the man who swung the axe could flee to a city of refuge where he was kept safe. However, the cities of refuge provided protection only for those who killed accidentally. So if a man hated his neighbour and killed him deliberately and then fled to one of the cities, he wouldn't get away with his crime. If he was guilty of murder, then the elders of the town were to send for him and they would hand them over to the avenger who was permitted to kill the murderer. Show him no pity, the Lord said. You must purge from Israel the guilt of shedding innocent blood. In other words, the only way to cleanse the land of Israel from the guilt of innocent blood was by killing the murderer. Purge the land. Rid the earth. And then the Lord added, so that it may go well with you. So God would be against them if they let the murderers go unpunished. So that's the background from Deuteronomy uh, chapter uh, 17. You can also read about the cities of refuge in Numbers 35. Now here's the thing. David was in Hebron and Hebron was a city of refuge. And these two brothers came to Hebron, a city of refuge. But they hadn't killed Ishbosheth accidentally. It wasn't as if they were sharpening their swords and accidentally stabbed him. No, they went to his house and they went into his bedroom with the intention of killing him. And therefore, since they were guilty of murder and not manslaughter, they deserved to die. And who had the right to kill them? Well, in Deuteronomy and Numbers, it refers to the avenger. And the avenger was a member of the victim's family who was responsible for seeking justice for his family and for making sure that someone paid for taking the victim's life. So who was the avenger? 
In this case, well, I think the avenger should have been Mephibosheth, who was mentioned in verse 4. He was Jonathan's son, and therefore he was Ishbosheth's nephew. And uh, he's the closest surviving male relative. The names of other relatives are mentioned in chapter 21, but I think Mephibosheth was the closest surviving relative. But he was only a young boy, and he was also Liam. He's not able to avenge the death of his uncle. And so David does what Mephibosheth was unable to do, and he killed the two brothers in order to purge their guilt from the land of Israel. David was a, a gentle king. He was willing to make peace with Abner when Abner was willing to accept David as his king. But David was also an obedient king. He was willing to obey the word of the Lord in all things. And therefore, since the Lord commanded that murderers should be killed in order to purge the guilt from the land, David gave the order for the two brothers to be killed. Show no pity, the Lord said in Deuteronomy. Purge the guilt of innocent blood from the land. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the true and final king, was obedient to his heavenly father when he was on the earth. And in obedience to his heavenly father, he was prepared not to kill, but to be killed. To be killed in order to cleanse you from the guilt of your sins. You're a sinner and you sin against the Lord continually. And because you're a sinner who has sinned against the Lord continually, you deserve the wrath and curse of God. You deserve to die as these two brothers deserve to die. And to suffer eternal punishment away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord Jesus Christ, in obedience to his Father in heaven, suffered and died on the cross in order to pay for your sins with his life. And in order to cleanse you from the guilt of your sins with his blood. And by believing in him, you're pardoned by God. And when the day of judgment comes, you will be acquitted of all charges against you. Because Christ the King shed his blood in order to cleanse you from your guilt. But here's the thing. On that day of judgment which is coming, Christ the King will show no pity to those who did not believe in him in this life. He will show them no pity, but he will condemn them and send them away to be punished forever. For all that they've done wrong. He's gentle towards all those who repent and believe in him. But he will show no pity towards those who will not repent and who will not believe. And he will ensure that they will pay for their sins. And so now is the time to repent. Now is the time. To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now is the time to turn from a life of sin and unbelief and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who is the only saviour of the world and who calls on sinners everywhere to believe in him for eternal life. In other words we must all do what the Israelites did in the second part of today's passage. We read in verse 1 of chapter 5 that all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron. Now presumably they didn't all come in person because there were now thousands of Israelites. So presumably the elders came and represented the rest. And they came and they confessed and even when Saul was their king, David was the one who led Israel into battle. He was the one who gave them victory over their enemies. And they confessed that God had chosen David to be the shepherd and ruler of his people. Uh, in different places in the Old Testament, the image of a shepherd is applied to the king. The king was like a shepherd. Because just as a shepherd led a sheep and protected the sheep, so the king led the people and the king protected uh, the people from danger. 
And David made a compact or covenant with the elders at Hebron uh, before the Lord. So in the presence of the Lord, they agreed to submit to David as their king. And they anointed him king over Israel. And so we read that David was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned for 40 years in total. So for seven and a half years in Hebron as king of Judah and then for another uh, 33 years in Jerusalem as king of all Israel. And as you know, I'm I'm sure, David was the first of many kings in Israel uh, when his son Solomon became king. The, The kingdom was divided once more into the north and the south into Israel and Judah. And so after Solomon, there was always a king in the north and there was another king in the south. Some of the kings were good and they walked in the ways of the Lord. Many of them were wicked and they disregarded the word of the Lord. And eventually, uh, hundreds of years later, the land of Israel was conquered by the Romans and it became part of the Roman Empire and the Roman Emperor, the Caesar, became their king. But in those days, when the Roman emperor was their king, a new king was born who was descended from King David. And that new king who was born, of course, was the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who is the true and final king. And after he died on the cross to pay for our sins, he was raised to new life and he was exalted to heaven where he was enthroned as king over all for the sake of his people. Sit at my right hand, the Lord said to him in Psalm 110. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So already he has conquered sin because he has paid for our sins with his life. But one day he will destroy sin completely when we're made perfect in his presence and will sin no more. Already he has conquered Satan because he's able to set his people free from Satan's tyranny. But one day he'll destroy Satan completely. Already he has conquered death because he was raised from the dead. Uh, But the day is coming when he will destroy death completely. Because death will have to give up all of its victims and all of Christ's people, those who believed in him and are members of God's kingdom, will be raised from the dead to live with him forever and forever in glory. So sit at my right hand in heaven, God said, until all your enemies have been destroyed and they all will be destroyed one day. The elders of Israel confess that David was their saviour and they confess that he was their king and that's what you must believe about the lord jesus christ trust in him as the only saviour because he saves his people from sin and satan and death and submit to him as your king and love and serve him always and those who trust in him as saviour can look forward to everlasting life in the new jerusalem to come And that takes us to the third part of today's passage. According to verse 6 of chapter 5, David and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. And the Jebusites were part of the Canaanites who were living in the promised land in the days of Joshua. And Joshua and the people of Israel were meant to drive them from the land. But while Joshua was able to conquer much of the land. Many of the Canaanites continued to live in the land. And of course, they were a thorn in the side of Israel because again and again, the the Philistines and the Amalekites and other Canaanites attacked the Israelites. And they were also a temptation to Israel because they tempted the Israelites to forsake the Lord and to worship their gods and idols. And so when David went up to Jerusalem to fight against the Jebusites. He was doing what the Lord had commanded his people to do years before. He had commanded them to show the Canaanites no mercy and to drive them from the land. And the the Jebusites, they felt pretty secure, didn't they? They felt safe and secure in their mountaintop city. And so they mocked David 
saying that even the blind and lame would be able to defend the city from David. Nevertheless, David captured Jerusalem, which became known as the city of David. And we read how, how David took up residence in the city and he built it up and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. King Haram of Tyre sent him wood and carpenters and stonemasons to help him and they built a palace for David. And according to verse 12, David knew that the Lord had established him as king and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people. Uh, he knew that God made him king, not for his own benefit, but for the benefit or for the good of God's people. And the passage ends with this note about David's children. More sons and daughters were born to him in Jerusalem. Let's finish by thinking about Jerusalem. David uh, built a palace for himself in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, in time, Solomon, his son, would build a temple for the Lord in Jerusalem. And so the Lord dwelt among his people in that city. And from there, the Lord ruled over his people. In time, because the people were unfaithful, God drove them from the land and sent them into exile. And Jerusalem was abandoned. But in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, the Lord brought the people back from exile and they rebuilt the temple and they rebuilt the city. And Nehemiah did his best to build a holy city. And he did his best to try to keep it holy and to fill it with God's holy people. But despite Nehemiah's best efforts to build a holy city and to keep it holy and to fill it with God's holy people, the city and its people always fell short of what they were meant to be. And so do you remember when the Lord Jesus was on the earth and he went up to the temple in Jerusalem, he discovered that it had become an unholy place. The people treated it like a marketplace instead of a, a place of prayer. And the people of Jerusalem, they rejected Jesus as their king and they crucified him and they persecuted his apostles. And so a few years after all of that, the city and the temple were destroyed by the Romans. The city of David was destroyed. But again, here's the thing. God has something better in store for you and for all of his people. If you believe his promises and trust in his son for forgiveness and for eternal life, he has something in better, better in store for you, which the earthly city of Jerusalem foreshadowed. When Christ the Saviour comes again, he'll bring you and all of his believing people into the new heavens and earth and into a new heavenly Jerusalem to be with him forever in glory. It'll be a far, far greater uh, city than the earthly Jerusalem ever was. Its wall, we're told in Revelation 21, is tall and strong. So, so this city, this city to come is secure and it will never be removed. And uh, nothing impure will ever enter there to spoil its holiness and its perfect peace. And the city to come will be filled with men and women and boys and girls from every nation, all who trusted in Christ the Saviour and who have been washed and cleansed and forgiven. And the tree of life is there, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. And whoever is thirsty is invited to come and to drink freely from the river of life and and they'll live forever. And uh, God himself is there. God himself is there to wipe the tears from your eyes. And there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain because they're former things. The things of this troubled life will have passed away. And all of God's people will live in peace and safety forever. So we think of this life uh, with all its troubles and its trials, its coronavirus and all the other diseases, uh, its sorrow and its sadness and its sin, we think of this life and, and we yearn for something better, don't we? 
We yearn for something better. And the Lord God Almighty has promised us something better. Life in the new Jerusalem, in the new and better world to come. Now, we know we don't deserve it because we're sinners who sin against the Lord continually. We deserve to be shut out of that holy city because we're unholy by nature. We deserve to be sent away from the presence of the Lord and punished forever. But the good news of the gospel is that God the Son came into the world as one of us to pay for our sins with his life and to cleanse us from our guilt with his blood. And through faith in him, we're pardoned and accepted by God. We're given the sure and certain hope of the resurrection and everlasting life in the new Jerusalem to come. And while we wait for it, while we wait for the new Jerusalem to come, we can look to Christ, our King, who's exalted to heaven to rule over all. We can look to him to lead us, to guide us, to guard us through every trial and through every trouble in this troubled life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your Son who came into the world as one of us to pay for our sins with his life and he shed his blood to cleanse us from our guilt. We thank you that by faith we are pardoned and accepted and can look forward to life in the heavenly Jerusalem in that new and better world to come. Enable us to trust in him and to keep trusting in him always so that we will never, ever stumble away from him. Once again, we lament before you because of this coronavirus crisis. Uh, we want to meet together in person to hear your word and to sing your praises and receive the Lord's Supper, which you've given us for our good. We want to have fellowship together in the name of Christ and to be able to stir one another up to love and good deeds. We want to see our family and friends without being worried about infection. We want to go to work and to the shops without being afraid. Heavenly Father, will you have mercy upon us, and not just upon us, but on the whole world. And so will you bring this crisis to an end. We pray too that you'll bring good out of this crisis, and that around the world many men and women and boys and girls will turn from their sin and unbelief and turn to Christ for forgiveness and for the hope of eternal life. Soften the hearts of unbelievers and enable them to acknowledge what they already know to be true deep down inside, that there is a God who rules and reigns over all and who deserves our praise and thanks. So enable them to acknowledge you and to repent of their sins and to seek you. And so despite all of the restrictions, we pray that Christ's church will grow throughout the world we pray too that you'll use this crisis to strengthen the faith of your people, and to make us more like our Saviour who suffered before entering his glory. We pray once again that you'll help the leaders of the world to know how best to respond to the crisis. We pray that you'll help all those who are caring for the sick and the dying. Thank you, Father, for them and for their hard work, and will you uphold them and help them? We pray that you'll protect the weak and the frail and the vulnerable. We pray that you'll help those who are struggling financially and who are worried about the future. Will you help parents who are worried about the effects of the crisis on their children? And we thank you for the vaccines and we pray that they will become available to people all over the world. And we ask too that you'll help people to comply with the restrictions that remain in place and to be careful when they're out and about. And Heavenly Father, we pray for one another in Emmanuel. Keep us all safe and well. Encourage and comfort us every day. And keep us from worrying. Help us to trust in your fatherly care. Build us up in our faith and in our love for one another. And keep us all on the narrow way that leads eventually to everlasting life in your presence. And we ask it in our Saviour's name. Amen. Let's praise God by singing When Peace Like a River. Whatever my love 
It is well. It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well. Go forth in the name of the Lord. This is God's charge. We should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>